Hey, good morning, eighth grade. How we doing? Uh, now we're going to try to do one of our e-learning days. I'm going to turn this into a YouTube video, um, but we're going to be getting into chapter 11, lesson one. That's going to be about those electrons and the energy levels. This is going to be the kind of starting phase of starting to see how ionic bonds and covalent bonds are formed. Uh, I'm going to try not to move too much, but I am going to be bringing us over to the periodic table that we have over there. But uh, at this point in time, you should have out your uh, your guided note sheet that I sent to each one of you on classroom. Okay. In this presentation, we're going to go over, kind of reiterate the purpose of the periodic table. We should be really familiar with it at this point in time. Uh, we're going to go over again, recapping how it's organized. We're going to be talking about the relationships that some of those groups, right, or those families might have with one another. And by the end of this, you're going to be able to illustrate and even be able to start to predict what's happening with these uh, with these atoms. Okay. So to start off looking at an atom, right, we should be familiar with this structure, right? We've seen the Bohr model of, a, uh, of an atom. And this is just going down into the smaller components. We know about protons, Right, those are positively charged subatomic particles. We have those electrons, which are negatively charged, and we have those neutrons with no charge. Okay, now does it get smaller than this? Yes, it does. But for what we need to know, this is really the extent of it. Right, um, it does get smaller into quarks. Right, uh, we've talked about that. Does it get even smaller than that? There are, I mean, that's what continued research is, is kind of being done on it, right? It's, um, as I've kind of always said to you all year, I'm not going to speak in absolutes that this is the absolute smallest. There's nothing smaller than this, right? I'm not going to say that because at some point in time, maybe there will be something, right? But up to current research, the smallest we have uh, are those like quarks and those components that they know of, uh, that they call them neutrinos. And that's when they start to talk about uh, dark matter and antimatter, all that, all that fun stuff that, you know, is is way ahead of where we need to be right now. Okay, so if anybody's ever seen Ant Man, I know it might be tough to see in this video. Um, again, if you want to go back through the slideshow, it's probably easier to see. But maybe you've seen Ant Man where he starts falling through uh, the quantum realm, and you can kind of see he starts falling into what looks like a virus. And as he's falling into the virus, it almost looks like he's encountering some small molecules, maybe some compounds that make up those viruses. And as he gets even further into that, he gets into, you can see those atoms. It almost looks like that Big Bang Theory as it flashes through the, uh, the screen uh, in those cutscenes. But you can kind of see those in the background as it quickly swift, uh, goes through as he starts to land on what looks like the nucleus of an atom. All right. Again, this is just getting into uh, those quarks that we were just talking about, those quarks. There's also leptons as well. It just uh, depends on whether you're looking at what makes up an electron and what makes up a, uh, a, a proton or a neutron, right? Um, again, this is getting into more of that quantum physics that, uh, again, for us is, is beyond what we need to be going into, right? But I want you to know that it exists and is out there. All right, so this portion of it really should be somewhat of the recap that I was just kind of saying we were going to be getting into, right? The periodic table, it's an organization of the chemical elements, right? Uh, at this point in time, I would be saying who is the person that uh, really pioneered and came up with the periodic table that we know of today, and maybe somebody in the back would be like, oh, I think it was some Russian guy. Yeah, you're on the right track. Uh, was his name Dmitry? Yeah, because he's Russian. All right. Or maybe Ukrainian. I didn't know him personally. Uh, but Dmitry Mendeleev, right? Or Mendeleev, I've heard people say. It's uh, really uh, tomato potato on that one. Um, but Mendeleev is the person who started to organize the periodic table. It was nice that he left those gaps in so that he could, uh, you know, knowing that other elements existed, 
The one that they always talk about there is that Eka aluminum, right, which ended up actually becoming gallium. Um, but as we know, it lists it in order by atomic number. And we have our groupings, which are going to be um, having similar properties. And that's why this is important. That's why it's important we start to reiterate this, because it's not only similar physical properties, uh, but it also has similar chemical properties as well uh, in terms of the number of valence electrons, which we're going to be getting into in a moment. All right. So we've seen this before or something similar to this. Right. It looks like a whole bunch of uh, lines going on, uh, you know, in all different directions right now. Um, but what we've seen it as is one, the atomic radius how it's increasing as you go down and is increasing as you go over. I know I'm going against the arrow right now, but that would be uh, getting smaller as you go towards the left side and getting larger as you go towards the right side. So the bottom right is going to have a bigger atomic radius than the bottom left, all right? Or I should say top left as well. All right, so most of the matter around you is made up of compounds. It is, I'm not gonna say it's incredibly rare, um, but a lot of the materials you find, a lot of the elements that are found are more often than not found as compounds opposed to pure substances, right? They have to, uh, in order to purify an element, they have to go through maybe some separation processes, um, you know, that might be involving uh, reaching boiling points to separate them uh, we've talked about different filtration methods. It's possible that that's what they would go through as well. It depends on the compound that's formed, uh, that's being formed. Uh, we talked about compounds that have been formed, right? We have, we've talked about, uh, sodium, uh, sodium chloride, right? NaCl. That's been a, a really common, uh, element that we've talked about because these two separately, right? As pure substances, pure sodium, right? Being a soft uh, a soft metal and chlorine being a, uh, a poisonous gas right if consumed right they end up forming a compound right that salt that is absolutely essential for all living things right it's what helps um, it what it's what helps kind of you know undergo reactions within the body uh, in terms of uh, needing a certain salinity in your uh, in your body right um, so the way that they're formed right the way these compounds are formed are with these chemical bonds so there is a force that's holding these atoms together and a lot of times a lot of times it's dependent on the electrons to form these bonds right that's what is that's what is going to be causing them to kind of gravitate towards one another or want to repel one another. All right, this is just a simple example. I really like this GIF. This is showing a covalent bond, which just is another way of showing that. So there's two major types of bonds, right? You're seeing right now the covalent bonds and we also have ionic bonds. So the covalent bonds here, these guys want to fill their orbital level. We know that hydrogen and helium, right? They ha could have in that first orbital, they could have a maximum of two, okay? And instead of one of them giving away an electron to the other, they're saying to one another, hey, we're going to stick together, all right? Um, you know, we're going to share this electron on both of our orbitals and we're both gonna be content because of it right? This is going to take what was two unstable atoms and is going to now stabilize them. Okay, so this is covalent bond is sharing. Okay, and then we have the opposite of this, right? We have an ionic bond. Okay, and this is what I was just talking about with, we have sodium, right? And we have chlorine, sodium chloride, also known as that table salt. You have Sodium, which is just one electron away from having a full orbital level, right? 
it loses that electron, it sheds that orbital level. Now it is totally full and totally stable. In this state, chlorine is just one away from filling its final orbital level, right? So as it takes away, as it takes away that electron, now you have something that's slightly more positive, slightly, slightly more negative. If you were in the class, I would be saying, why is one positive? Why is one negative? You're not here, all right? But the reason for that is the electrons, as we know, are slightly negative. We have protons, again, as we said in the beginning, that are positive, okay? Positively charged. As you remove an electron, now this overall atom is going to be slightly positively charged. This is going to be slightly more negatively charged. And those two are going to attract and want to stay, uh, stay together as a result, right? Forming that ionic bond that you kind of see going on here. All right. Our next thing that we're going to be moving into, this is what's known as a Lewis dot structure. And this is, you can see, the nice thing about the Lewis dot structure compared to, say, the Bohr diagram that we've done, uh, we've seen the Bohr diagrams have all of the electrons on them, right? It shows an element with all of its listed uh, electrons. The nice thing about the Lewis dot is that it's going to show only the valence electrons, which just means it's showing only the electrons that are in the outermost shell, right? We're looking at carbon, and we know that it has six altogether, right? As its atomic number is six, it's going to have six electrons as well, but it's not showing those extra two, right? Um, it's only showing what's in that outermost shell. So that outermost shell is only going to have those four electrons. This is what makes carbon so unique. Um, it's able to form the most bonds. This is why uh, carbon light is possible, right? Uh, when you get into organic chemistry, that's something that they'll talk about that makes carbon so unique compared to a lot of the other uh, elements. You're not able to really have uh, other elements that are capable of forming uh, as many bonds as carbon. So it really uh, it tends to be this, this blue that anchors a lot of compounds together. Um, but you can see, right? They're showing, they're showing the sharing of electrons going on between these. They don't want to be necessarily stealing them. So these are showing covalent bonds that are occurring between these, uh, between these, these elements, right? And you can see, instead of drawing the dots, eventually you're going to see they will actually start to draw in these lines in order to represent the bonds. So they'll show instead of instead of two shared electrons, they're going to show it as just a line connecting them. So you'll see going forward, and especially more so in the next lesson, that these carbon, uh, these carbons have a double bond. That's why it looks like that equal sign. It goes as high as three. That's again, not necessary uh, for right this uh, at this moment, but you can see, oh, there you go in the bottom here, right? It's showing a triple bond. So you have single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds, right? That's the, uh, and you can have, you can have a, uh, like a quadruple bond being formed between two carbons. Again, you're gonna see it more, uh, more likely maxing out at that triple bond. All right, um, again, this is just showing that representation again. This is, I think it gets a little bit too clustered when you show it like this. Um, I prefer it to be, uh, I prefer you do it with the lines uh, and you'll see, we'll even do uh, skeletal models uh, later on as well. But uh, you're gonna see, this is the way we're going to be doing it most frequently. Because you, know, you get to a point where instead of counting dots, you're gonna end up counting lines, which ends up becoming uh, a little bit more simplified, all right? So electrons are the atomic particles that participate in chemical bonding. The amount of energy an electron can have is an energy level. So electrons closest to the nucleus have the least energy and electrons furthest from the nucleus have the most energy. The reason they say this, and the reason this is a statement uh, that's, that's frequently made is because 
it's showing or it's talking about how the ones that are in that furthest orbital level, farthest from the nucleus, as we go further out, they're the ones that are most likely to react. I just want to go back to this for one moment and, and kind of talk about that. You can see, obviously, these electrons that are in that, that second orbital level aren't going anywhere, but that third is the one that would be the most reactive. Same thing that's going on with chloride here, right? That first and second orbital level aren't reacting, but you can see this third is most active when it comes to, uh, when it comes to any reactions taking place. In this case, a, uh, an ionic bond being formed. All right. So you have, so as we go through our orbital levels, you can even see the number of electrons in each of them changes. Our first orbital level, we're only going to have two. Our second, we're going to have eight. Third, we're going to have 18. Fourth, we're going to have 32. Just to bring you over here for one moment, you can even see how that matches up, right? We could see. We know these noble gases are the most stable, okay? So if that's the case, right, it's going to have the maximum amount of valence electrons in the outermost shell. So we know helium is going to have two, all right? We know that in the outermost shell, right, we know neon is going to have, is going to have 10 total, but if they're talking about valence electrons, neon's going to have eight, all right? And you would continue, you would continue going on down uh, just like that, right? Again, the number of valence electrons is going to, uh, in, the, in the noble gases, is going to be most stable. It's going to be at the maximum. These guys do not want to react. These guys do not want to form bonds. That's why you would be more likely to see these uh, as a pure substance in, uh, in nature compared to any others, right? Especially compared to this grouping here. This group is going to want to form bonds most readily, uh, namely uh, uh, those covalent bonds. These guys are going to want to just give up that one valence electron that they have. These guys are going to want to give up those two valence electrons that they might have. So this is why we always say, right, this grouping here, right, our alkaline metals, our alkaline earth metals, these guys are going to want to be forming their bonds, right, with these non-metals over here, right? Uh, this grouping, right, these oxygen, sulfur, uh, sulfur, selenium, they're going to want to be forming bonds with this grouping here, with that alkaline earth metal. So you would see a bond uh, between, say, magnesium and oxygen, right? And the reason you would have that is because this wants to give up two Oxygen is only two valence electrons away from being stable, okay? So we'll go into a few examples with that. We'll get back over, over to our screen. I hope uh, I'm not making anybody throw up there looking and spinning around here, okay? So you can see, right, the number of valence electrons is depicted on this. This, is, this would be your typical Bohr model. Uh, this is what you would see. Uh, depicting all of the electrons. Again, this gets a little bit more tedious. This is a little bit more, um, uh, in some ways, more difficult to work with because you end up, you have a higher likelihood of making a mistake when you're looking at all the electrons opposed to just the valence electrons. All right, the maximum number of electrons at the first energy level, which is closest to the nucleus, is two, right? And that's what we see. Uh, well, Hydrogen, you'd see, uh, only has one. But if we were looking at helium again, you would just see a second, uh, a second electron attached to it. All right. The maximum number of electrons in the second energy level is eight, and the outermost electrons in an atom involved in chemical bonding. Right. This is why. This is why we said in that previous statement, the outermost electrons have the highest energy level. They're the ones that are reacting most. All right, and that's because they're further from the nucleus. They're less; uh, they have less of that attachment. They have less of that connection to the nucleus, so they're more willing to let uh, to let that go as well. All right. So, how many electrons per shell? 
Again, this is just recapping. Okay, so we go two, eight, eight. All right. Uh, again, it get you get more as you go through them. Actually, this is a pretty good depiction as well. Uh, I like using I like using this one. You can see for something like Krypton. And looking at all the valence electrons in that fourth shell. And you can see as you go down here, right? As you go down, as you go down the periods, they have one, right? These guys are going to have a second orbital level. These guys are going to have a third orbital level. These will have a fourth. As you go down, the uh, periods, the orbital level increases, and it caps out at it caps out at seven. All right, but they all still behave. They all still behave the same exact way. Maybe you can see what's kind of happening here. Uh, we have we're looking at lithium, and you're looking at this uh, this valence electron right here uh, in that outermost shell in that second orbital level compared to, uh, and that's why you would see lithium form a bond with fluorine here, because as you can see, this is one short of having a full valence electron and being stable. That's what all of these, uh, that's what all of these atoms are seeking. They're all seeking um, to be totally balanced and stable. Right, so a valence electron in an outermost elect, uh, is an outermost electron that participates in chemical bonding. The number of valence electrons in an atom tells you how many bonds an atom can form. Each element in the same group in the periodic table has the same number of valence electrons. So that's what we were saying. As you go down, looking at lithium, sodium, potassium, all of them are going to have the same number of valence electrons. The only thing that's different with, with each of them is going to be the number of orbitals that they have holding those valence electrons. Okay, again, looking at, this is that Bohr model that we're looking at, starting with helium all the way on the side here, knowing that it has two electrons filling this orbital level and looking at say potassium here it is only one short so even the the thought of having potassium and chloride right potassium chloride is a is a chemical compound potassium wants to give up its one valence electron chlorine wants to take on its one valence electron all right, so the electron dot diagram is a model that represents the valence electrons. As I said prior to this, it's easier to work with. It's a little bit more streamlined. You're looking at, in terms of chemical reactions, you're looking at the, um, the valence electrons, which are doing all the work. They're the ones doing all the chemical bonding. So this is, this is a model that makes more sense than using the Bohr model. You don't need to draw all those interior orbitals with all the electrons because they're not necessarily involved. You're looking at the electrons that are most involved with the, uh, with the valence electrons here. All right. So again, the number of unpaired dots in the electron dot diagram tells you how many bonds an atom can form. They're both looking to just become stable. As I said prior to this, these guys are just looking to either fill their final orbital level or give off and fill the prior orbital level. The chlorine here is less likely, it's an easier task for it to steal an electron than it is to find an, uh, find an atom that, it, that wants to take on all seven of these, right? So it's easier to find another atom that just wants, uh, that's more likely to give up one more, right? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see two fluorine atoms um, 
you know, you wouldn't see them necessarily interacting with each other the same way potassium and chlorine would in this valence electron, right? Because neither one of them would want to necessarily give any electrons off. So it would definitely, it would definitely um, be a very different interaction than between potassium and chlorine. All right. Again, this is why we use the electron dot instead of drawing, drawing out, uh, instead of drawing out all eleven electrons for sodium. You only have to draw, you only have to draw the one that's being in, uh, that would be involved. Okay, so opposed to using our Bohr model, we're going to more likely be using this Lewis dot structure in order to. Uh, kind of depict what's happening with our covalent bonds. Okay. And again, you can kind of see, I'm going to send out this, this sheet for you guys to fill out on your own. So you'd have your own copy of it, but it's the same thing you're seeing here. It's the same representation. This group, right? This group all has one valence electron. This group all has two valence electrons. Now the reason, now you, I'm sure you noticed we skipped over the transition metals. They don't really follow this same uh, covalent and ionic bond trend. So we don't, we kind of skip over them. That's why, uh, again, you're looking, as we're looking at this, at this depiction of it, I'm sure you noticed all the transition metals are missing from this. That's the, that's the rationale behind it. These are the elements that are going to participate in that uh, ionic and covalent bond. All right. But you can see just the most important takeaway here is all as you get further to the right, they're getting closer to maximizing and filling that valence electron, that final orbital. Right. As you go further to the left, it's further away from filling out that final orbital level. All right, so many atoms are stable with eight valence electrons. An atom with at least one unpaired electron is unstable. Stable atoms do not, <clears throat> excuse me, easily react with or form bonds with other atoms. All right, this is why we talked about it. You've heard of them, the noble gases, the inert gases. As soon as they become stable, right? Well, they are naturally stable. They don't want to necessarily interact with anything else, right? They're content. They have their, they have exactly how many electrons they want to have. And sharing or providing any other electrons is only going to create instability with that atom. All right. And helium. Helium is the only one that has the exception of having the eight valence electrons. And obviously, as we go underneath Krypton as well, that's, that's also the case. Rules get a little bit different as you get beyond, the, uh, beyond these orbital levels. We're not going to go too much further than probably three or four orbital levels. Beyond that, it's... Uh, you know, it, it, it's beyond the level that we need to be kind of working with this. Okay. So these, this is showing, this is showing all of the uh, noble gases that have eight electrons in the outermost shell. Right? They just keep adding those shells, adding those uh, orbital levels outside of that nucleus. And if these were to react, you would be saying that the outermost electrons would be the ones that are most likely to react. These guys, obviously, being those inert gases, are not necessarily participating in chemical bonds. So unstable atoms can become stable only by forming chemical bonds with other atoms. Atoms tend to gain, lose, or share valence electrons until each atom has the same number of valence electrons as the noble gases, stable atoms have four pairs of valence electrons. Now, the reason they're saying four pairs, something that isn't necessarily being depicted here, 
when you look at, uh, we'll go back to the valence, uh, to the Lewis dot structure here, you'll see that they depict, they depict the valence electrons in this in pairs, right? As you go, uh, go around, as soon as you get beyond carbon, right? They start, these uh, valence electrons begin to pair up with one another as you go around uh, that final orbital level until it's full, right? We have, uh, we know there's going to be eight, right? So two, four, six, eight, right? You're seeing four paired electrons in that outermost shell. All right, so you're looking at, again, these are two unstable atoms, two unstable elements that become stable once they form a bond with one another, right? We said, as I said earlier, you go from having a atom, you go from having individual atoms that on their own when introduced to the human body would be lethal, right? But when they form this compound, when they form this bond together, it becomes something that's essential, right? That humans, that all, uh, really all animals need in order to survive. We need a base level of salts in our, in our body, all right? So just as I could, a few recap questions here. So what is the relationship between the valence electrons of an atom and the chemical bonds the atom can form, okay? So again, Right, we've said this earlier on. So valence electrons determine how many chemical bonds an atom can form. Generally, atoms with seven or fewer valence electrons are unstable and form chemical bonds with other atoms to become stable. I also wrote up a couple other questions here just as I was trying to uh, trying to come up with some material for you guys. All right, so. Yeah, maybe you would have been asking, why do you think compounds make up most of the matter around us? Again, there's only there's only the noble gases that are not looking to form. Let me see if I can get to that slide. Great love when things are going really well technologically. Uh, be on your game, Mr. Walls. This isn't it. People are probably yelling at the screen right now. You went past it. I know. Maybe I did it on purpose. But the reality is I missed it. There we go. All right. So again, looking uh, just at these noble gases here. These are the inert gases. They do not want to react. And they're you know, there's a reason why there's only six of them in that grouping. Six of them out of 118 elements are, are the ones that are not naturally looking to form bonds. So, you know, the reason you're going to find compounds is there's more unstable elements on the periodic table, way more unstable elements on the periodic table than there are stable. Okay. Another question I got here is how is an electron's energy related to its position in an atom. So we have the higher energy electrons are farther away from the nucleus of an atom. Lower energy electrons are closer to the nucleus. Again, that's just referring to this idea here. These electrons are quote unquote less active because they are, they are not wanting to participate in the reaction. It's the ones on that outermost shell that are going to be participating in the reaction. They have more energy, all right? So which electron configuration do the elements in group one share? So if we come on over here again, all right, looking at group one. So something group one has in common, right? All these guys in this first grouping all have one valence electron. Right, all of these only have one valence electron, meaning they're looking to just get rid of their one electron in order to be stable. Okay, now as we said before, uh, uh, as we go down, right, the orbital level increases. One, two, three, four, five, right, and 
again, the number of valence electrons stays the same, even though the number of electrons overall is increasing. All right. And how could we compare or contrast, really mainly contrasting here, between unstable atoms and stable atoms? Well, as we're looking at the periodic table here, our stable atoms, our stable atoms being shown there with our noble gases, those are not looking to react while these unstable atoms here are looking to react. But they're looking to react in order to be like these noble gases. These guys all want to be just like their noble gases. It's just the manner in which they go about trying to achieve it. Are they going to steal electrons? Are they going to steal those valence electrons or are they going to share it, right? These guys are less likely, right? These are not going to be involved in sharing electrons. These are going to be involved with other atoms that want to either gain or lose uh, electrons, right? In this case, these want to gain, these want to lose. That's why you're going to see them forming forming those bonds together, okay? So as I'm walking back over here, guys, all right, I hope this can kind of help out and maybe be a good resource for you. Uh, you know, as we're hitting the, the 36 minute mark, um, I know it was a lot of material, but the good thing now, instead of doing those live sessions, you can go back to any point in the video. As always, if you have any questions, you have any concerns, something isn't making any sense, reach out to me, right? I'm always here. Uh, email me. No, don't call me. I'm not giving you my phone number. You know, uh, I just don't trust you. Uh, but, you know, as they say uh, on YouTube, smash that like button, dude. All right. Subscribe to it. You know, whatever they also say. I don't really, uh, I don't really follow enough. All right. Gang, gang.